Okay, let's go. Dzień dobry, witamy wszystkich na kolejnym spotkaniu Win Novelators Club. Dzisiaj naszym gościem jest Pete Warden. Pete, thank you for being with us. Nasz panel poprowadzi, naszą prezentację poprowadzi dr Milena Ratajczak oraz profesor Maciej Konacki. Mam nadzieję, że będą, że uzyskają Państwo dużo wiedzy od Spita i że jak zwykle będziemy się świetnie bawić. Paweł, powiedz kilka słów, co czeka nas w przyszłym tygodniu również Pewnie. na Win Innovators Club. To tylko dodam, że już w środę następne nasze spotkanie. O godzinie 20 spotkamy się z największymi autorytetami od modeli biznesowych, czyli Aleksandrem Osterwalderem i profesorem Yves Pinie. Zaczynajmy. Zaczynamy. Dziękujemy bardzo. Okay, so I guess we can now switch to English. So, um, good evening everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to moderate a meeting today uh, with such an outstanding guest that we, uh, we are hosting tonight. Uh, and especially the subject of the talk we will, uh, we will listen in a, in a moment is very close to my heart as I'm astronomer. Uh, And uh, I would like to ask um, Professor Maciej Konaski from the, from the Polish Space Agency uh, and also from Copernicus uh, uh, Astronomical Center to introduce our guest. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, when I was going through the biography of Dr. Warden, I was uh, quite... Uh, it, 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 There is a story that uh, it's related to the Polish uh, uh, science fiction writer Stanislaw Lem, who was uh, 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 well known uh, a few decades ago. And uh, there were a few people that thought that uh, a person like this cannot exist because uh, he, he wrote so many ex interesting, uh, exquisite books that uh, that uh, some people th thought that he, he couldn't exist. So Dr. Ward has a biography which 
if I didn't know he did exist, he does exist, <laughs> uh, that uh, I wouldn't believe myself. It, this is just an exquisite biography, uh, which is uh, very different topics that are hard to combine in, in, in one person. I'm, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Warden. Uh, Dr. Warden, prior to joining the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, was the director of NASA Ames Research Center. He has held several positions in the United States Air Force, uh, uh, ending his career as a Brigadier General. Uh, uh, he was also a, a, an advisor consultant to the DARPA Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, and after that, he served as a research professor of astronomy at the University of Arizona. Dr. Ward has co-authored uh, offered and co-authored more than 130 scientific papers in astronomy, space science, and strategic studies. Uh, moreover, he has served as a scientific advisor for two NASA, NASA space science missions. Uh, right now, he's leading, uh, uh, among others, the, the breakthrough initiatives. One of them is the Breakthrough Starshot initiative to develop and, and launch Earth's first interstellar probe within a generation. Uh, this is uh, uh, really impressive. Uh, I, I would like to give uh, you know, the, the audience to, to Dr. Warden. Well, thank you. Uh, let, me, uh, let me share the screen here and hopefully this will work. Uh, uh, Okay, can everybody hear me uh, the, and uh, see the screen? Yep. Yeah, yeah, all is fine. Well, I'm I'm really honored to uh, to take part in this webinar. It's uh, I'm I'm actually in uh, Luxembourg. Uh, I've been here for the last month and a half. Uh, uh, in addition to working for the Breakthrough Initiatives, I also advise the government of Luxembourg on uh, on their space program and and space resources, but. Uh, what I'd like to talk to uh, about today is our initiatives, and uh, uh, this is a privately funded effort. I'll tell you a little bit about them. Uh, I've been involved in these for about five years. Uh, the, uh, the privately funded to really address the questions of life in the universe. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about some maybe some of the more controversial things, which is, you know, where did life come from? uh the search for extraterrestrial intelligence and our and our solar system uh the uh, initiatives were started in uh july uh of uh of 2015 uh our primary sponsor is uh, yuri milner uh who's a, a physicist himself and an investor uh he's both a russian and israeli citizen but lives uh, in silicon valley uh, the, uh, he's had a long-standing dream that, uh, that he could support, uh, uh, research to, to address some of the fundamental questions. Uh, you'll see in this, uh, in, in this chart, uh, when we made the announcement for the start of the initiatives, that, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, was also present. He was our advisor until he, uh, until he passed away last year and, and made significant, uh, inputs into, into our program. Uh, the fundamental questions that, that we are trying to address uh, are really threefold. Uh, the first one is, uh, is, uh, uh, is there other life in the universe? And I'll talk a little bit about where we are looking. Uh, the, uh, and, and, you know, as of yet, of course, they haven't found anything, but uh, this is an effort just beginning. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, the second question uh, is there intelligent life elsewhere? And, uh, and, and when I'm asked about intelligent life and what you mean, I, I usually make the statement that, uh, that the closer you are to a national capital, the less likely you are to find intelligent life. Uh, but uh, uh, this is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence SETI, and I'll tell you a little bit about those. But the third one, and this is the one that I, actually is closest to my own heart, is the question is, can we travel between the stars? And this has been a long-standing dream. Uh, I mean, I grew up as a, as a little boy during the Apollo program when it was being developed. And uh, I always had the dream that, uh, that maybe eventually we could travel to the stars. And uh, 
uh, our program is designed to, to at least begin to address that. Well, we have three major programs. Uh, Mr. Milner has uh, contributed uh, uh, over 200 million US dollars to this 10-year uh, effort. Uh, and there are three ongoing efforts and there'll be there's a fourth one we're considering. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later in my talk. Uh, but the, uh, the first one is what we call Breakthrough Watch. And this is an effort to, to see if we can find a life-bearing planet orbiting one of the nearby stars. Uh, our particular focus is the Alpha Centauri system, uh, the nearest system. It's uh, about 4.3 light years away. Uh, the system actually consists of three stars. Uh, two of them are more or less like the sun, and the third one is a, a small star uh, called the Red Dwarf Star, uh, Proxima Centauri. Uh, we have just completed last year our first research effort in this. Uh, we used uh, the, uh, the very large telescope facility that the European Southern Observatory has in, in Chile. Uh, we developed an instrument that uh, would look for uh, heat signatures of a direct, to be able to directly image at 10 microns in the infrared if there was a planet uh, orbiting one of the two solar type stars. Uh, we had uh, about 100 hours of observations on, the, on this eight meter telescope. Uh, we did not find a planet. Uh, we were looking for something that would be what we call the habitable zone. Uh, this is a region where liquid water could exist in the surface, uh, but our sensitivity was, was only such that we would have been able to find something three or four times bigger than the Earth, something maybe the size of Neptune. Uh, so we're, we're looking at uh, a next phase to get uh, much better uh, data. Uh, we do have another program that we have just started, uh, which is a small satellite. Uh, this small satellite is designed to, to do what's called astrometry, that is to measure the position of one star relative to the other to incredible accuracies, something like a millionth of an arc second. Uh, if we can achieve that accuracy, we can see small changes in the motion as one star orbits the other. They orbit uh, in an 80 year period. Uh, if there's a planet orbiting them, uh, that wobble of the, of the, of the star uh, that uh, would tell us that not only if there's a planet there, but we can get evidence of, of the mass. So this is the, this is the first uh, uh, set of efforts. And, uh, uh, we are planning more observations in the future, but it's, it's going quite well. The second effort uh, is uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We called that Breakthrough Listen. Uh, this was actually the program we announced in, uh, at the Royal Society in London in, in 2015. Uh, this one is 100 million US dollars that, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, devoted to using some of the world's largest radio and optical uh, telescopes to see if we can see a signal that uh, a uh, uh, alien civilization might be trying to send towards us. Uh, our objectives are to use a number of these telescopes to, uh, uh, to eventually look at a million of the nearest stars. This takes us out to about a thousand light years uh, and our primary objective is to see if somebody is trying to signal us. Uh, so we're, we're just beginning these efforts. Uh, uh, several instruments that we were using quite extensively. Uh, in the upper part of the chart there, you'll see uh, uh, the Parkes radio telescope, which is uh, in Australia. It's the second largest radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and then the lower uh, part of the chart, you'll see the uh, Green Bank, uh, uh, 100 meter telescope, it's the largest steered antenna uh, that is used for radio astronomy. Uh, those have been going for about four years, uh, uh, but probably the most in interesting instruments that we have just begun to use is uh, in South Africa is the, the first part of what eventually will be a several thousand radio antennas that are called the square kilometer array. Uh, these are the ones that we'll primarily be using to look for the million nearest stars. Uh, the, also on the upper part of the chart, you'll see the, the, the Chinese 500 meter telescope. It's the world's largest radio telescope. 
Uh, we are just beginning to use that in collaboration with our Chinese colleagues. Uh, we're also doing a lot of optical uh, observations to see if we can find perhaps a laser signal. Uh, so this program is ongoing quite well. It's being run for us by the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, we haven't found any alien signals, but we found a lot of really neat astronomy with it. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, probably the, to me, the most exciting program is Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, this uh, is uh, designed to, to see if we can't, within several generations, within, within several decades, develop a method that we could actually send a probe uh, to, initially we're looking at the Alpha Centauri system. Uh, we'd like to, uh, to be able to accelerate these probes to something like 20% the speed of light, uh, which is about a thousand times faster than any spacecraft we have today. Uh, the, uh, uh, the only way we can figure out how to do that with technology that we have in hand, or will have in hand, is to is to use a very very small spacecraft, uh, uh, a basically a chipset, a nanosat, of about one gram payload. I'll tell you a little more about that in a second. Uh, and then we use a very large laser. Uh, laser would have something like two or uh, one or two hundred gigawatts of power. Uh, we then uh, would place these small chips in a mothership in orbit. Uh, they would be attached to a light sail, which is a thin material of, uh, uh, that would be deployed much like a, a sailboat deploys it. We then hit that sail for about 10 minutes with the beam, the laser beam, and it accelerates at very, very high acceleration to 20% the speed of light. Uh, the, the spacecraft then travels through interstellar space, uh, coasting basically for 20, 25 years. Uh, flies by the target uh, uh, planets, and uh, we hope to find the, the, our targets. We do know that there is an Earth-sized planet in the Proxima Centauri system. It's a small red dwarf star. You can see an artist's conception of what that might look like. Uh, the, uh, but this, uh, this is very exciting. We would take images and, and transmit them back to Earth. Uh, we've just begun the first phase of research. Uh, uh, where we're looking at the key technical questions that uh, before we move to the next one, uh, there uh, does a, uh, can you build a laser that's affordable, that has enough power and get the beam through the atmosphere? Uh, can you build a light sail that can take that much power? And probably to me, the most important one is, can you communicate back from Alpha Centauri? Uh, we also have an annual conference uh, that, uh, that has uh, three or 400 people that attended uh, uh, in 2019, a year ago, we discussed a very interesting question, which I'll talk a little more about here in my talk, is uh, where did life come from? And uh, I'd say the majority of, of, uh, of uh, uh, geneticists and astrobiologists believe that life arose on Earth, although there is a minority that thinks that life may have come from elsewhere, and I'll tell you a little bit of what the evidence is. Uh, we think that uh, uh, this is a very exciting area that, that uh, is just beginning to be uh, researched. And uh, it may have something to do with, in the future, uh, our ability to send life elsewhere, a very exciting effort. Uh, we were going to have a conference here several weeks ago, but uh, because of the coronavirus uh, crisis, we've deferred that till next year. Uh, that one will be looking at a, a different question. Are we looking at the right places for life? Uh, let me talk a little bit about panspermia. Uh, and this is a, a fairly uh, controversial idea, but that there are, uh, you know, a small number of scientists that believe that life did not originate on Earth, that it came from space. Uh, the, uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion of this idea the, uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, that there were people like Fred Hoyle and, and uh, with Promising who suggested that viruses came from space, maybe an interesting topic for today. Uh, but the, uh, probably the more interesting question is why would you think that life might have come from, from space? Uh, if you look at the history of life on Earth, you find that, 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 that life 
the oldest evidence of life that it, it is a, almost 4 billion years ago uh, that uh, life emerged. And what's interesting about this is that, that this was within a couple hundred million years of the first or the, the, the cooling of the earth. And uh, for what I'll show you in a moment, there are people that believe that that, that wasn't enough time for life to evolve uh, on our planet. Uh, the, the most interesting thing you'll see on this is that, that the original organism that we can now trace all life on Earth back to is called the last universal common ancestor, LUCA. And it emerged again about 3.7 to 3.8 billion years ago. Uh, LUCA, it was interesting because it, we, we pretty much know what its genome looked like, what its genetic code looked like. Uh, and the most interesting thing in it is that uh, the genetic code contains the instructions for the ribosome. The ribosome is basically the, the, the engine that drives uh, activities in a cell. It's basically a very complicated moving machine, biological machine that, uh, that is uh, managed by uh, RNA uh, to, uh, to produce proteins. Uh, this was fully developed in LUCA, and there are some that believe that it's unlikely that this would have evolved in several hundred million years, so uh, this is one of the pieces of evidence that we might look uh, for life coming from elsewhere. Uh, again, a very controversial area. Now, w there's been a lot of people that suggested, well, life might come from between, you know, Mars, the Earth and, and Venus, because early in the solar system, there were lots of asteroids hitting these planets and material would be driven or thrown off one and may come to another one. But until very recently, most people said, or most uh, astronomers said, it's very unlikely that material could travel between star systems. Uh, well, something changed here about a year and a half ago. We discovered the first interstellar asteroid uh, this is the asteroid Oumuamua, uh, which is ancient Hawaiian for distant traveler. And uh, it was discovered uh, about, uh, you know, almost two years ago. Uh, interestingly enough, we didn't see it coming into the solar system. We only caught it going out, but it was our first interstellar asteroid. We have since then have at least one, maybe several, several more of these interstellar asteroids. But what's kind of interesting about it, this is a very strange object. It had a very funny shape. It was very elongated. Uh, but also, as it was leaving the solar system, it accelerated slightly. Now, uh, this uh, does occur on occasion. Usually, it's in, in a comet, uh, which is a, uh, an icy body that, that is outgassing uh, uh, water and other gases that can actually cause it to accelerate. But there was no evidence of, of, of cometary material on Oumuamua. Uh, this led uh, uh, this gentleman, uh, this is a very famous astronomer. This is uh, uh, Professor Avi Loeb, who's the chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard. Uh, he's also the uh, chair of our advisory committee for Starshot. And he uh, pointed out that actually this object behaved more like one of our uh, laser driven light sails uh, than, uh, than a natural object. So he suggested uh, uh, in the astrophysical journal that this might have been a, a probe intentionally sent to Earth. Uh, th this, most astronomers thought this was rubbish. Uh, and uh, Professor Loeb, uh, you know, he was very cheerful about it. He said, well, that's why he's happy that he has tenure because he can go write these things. Uh, but uh, it is an interesting suggestion. I think most people think it, it was a natural object now, but at least it, it's uh, something we should look at. Now, this raises the question of, of that maybe life came from elsewhere, but maybe it was put here. And uh, this is called directed panspermia. Uh, this was first uh, suggested in the early 1970s uh, by the uh, late Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, Francis Crick, who was the co-discoverer of DNA, along with a British chemist. Uh, and he suggested that maybe life was planted here four billion years ago. Uh, deliberately. Uh, so this gets into a lot of science fiction questions, but uh, again, uh, it raises the issue is if life was planted here, can we figure that out? Uh, now, I'd like to turn a little bit to the, the question of uh, 
of, uh, of how life might be planted somewhere else. And the interesting thing is that uh, if you look at our system we're trying to develop, uh, which has a gram uh, system and uh, uh, works because we leave the fuel on earth and, and we attach the chip to a sail and we use a laser wind. The laser is a wind, this is basically a sailboat. And it's feasible, we think, because of the, 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 the development of laser technology is such that, that we think building a 100 gigawatt laser will be affordable within a few decades. Uh, we've already launched into space uh, prototypes of the Starship, the Graham class spacecraft, which is made feasible because of microelectronics. So the technology seems to be coming along. Uh, now, I, I put this uh, picture of this gentleman up. This is uh, George Church, uh, who's a, a geneticist at Harvard University. Uh, I sort of uh, like his picture because he sort of looks like what I imagine God might look like. And uh, uh, he, we had a conference about a year and a half ago, which he came to, and he pointed out that, uh, that, that with technology that we can develop, that we could put on one of these chips uh, a, uh, uh, some sort of biomechanical device that could boot up life elsewhere. And so he pointed out that the feasibility of actually planning life elsewhere is within our grasp, perhaps later this century. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, now to be sure, there's a lot of ethics questions. Is this a good idea or not? But uh, it makes some of these possibilities of rather, you know, exotic uh, uh, possibilities for the century that humanity has some rather interesting capabilities possible. So, you know, maybe in a few thousand years, we'll find that we planted life elsewhere that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that, uh, formerly dead planets can be made come alive. Now, uh, I wanna to turn to the final topic, which is, uh, is probably closer to home. And uh, we have a new program that uh, we're considering developing. And the, and the question is, where can we look for life in our solar system? Now, to be sure, a lot of space agencies are looking at this. Uh, we just completed a design study that we could send uh, a probe, uh, and we worked with NASA on this. It would be a, jointly public-private funded effort uh, that we would send a, uh, a probe to Europa, which is uh, uh, one of the large moons of Jupiter. Uh, the uh, Europa is rather interesting because it, uh, uh, it's believed to be an ocean world, that, it's, uh, that uh, the entire moon is covered with an ocean that's, that's over 100 kilometers thick, and on top of the ocean is ice. Uh, in fact, we know that the ice cracks on occasion and, and some, of the, some of the water from that ocean appears to escape in space. There's also a, a similar moon orbiting Saturn called Enceladus. Uh, the Cassini mission was able to sample the water in those water plumes and actually found evidence of simple organic molecules. Uh, the, uh, so the idea is maybe we could send a probe to see if we could find a more complex uh, molecules and evidence of life. Uh, but my personal favorite is uh, actually Venus. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, Venus, now everybody, when I went to school, we, we found out that Venus, the surface of it is literally hellish. It's uh, 500 degrees centigrade. Uh, and it was kind of dismissed as a place for life. Uh, however, uh, there's a level at about 50 kilometers in the, in the atmosphere that, uh, that the temperature and pressure are sort of what they are here on the surface of the earth. Uh, it's about uh, uh, 20 degrees centigrade, one bar pressure. Now, the, the, it's right in the middle of the clouds. The clouds on Venus are not very hospitable uh, for life as we know it. Uh, it's sulfuric acid, very, very acidic environment. Uh, but we do know that there is life forms on Earth that, that actually thrive in, in high acid environments, in, in hot springs at higher temperatures. There is some interesting evidence that there could be life there. And so we are considering potentially sending a probe uh, to this uh, that, that would enter the, the, the atmosphere of Venus uh, uh, and look for life. 
Uh, indeed, uh, just before the lockdown, I was intending to visit Poland. I was at some appointments uh, with the people in the space agency. Potentially, we're putting together a global effort to to maybe uh, to work on on such a mission, and hopefully, after the the, the crisis has passed, we'll be able to pick that up. Uh, but I do want to talk about some really bizarre uh, data. Uh, the, uh, the, the Russians did send a number of probes, several of them landed on the surface of Venus. Uh, uh, at least two of them got to the surface and, and, and took a number of data. Uh, this was a paper that uh, the head of IKI, the, the Russian Space Science Agency, gave me a, a, a last year. Uh, Lev Zlyenyi, and uh, uh, this is sort of an interesting result. Uh, these are images that were taken from the surface of Venus, uh, and this is, remember, this is about 90 bars of pressure at 500 degrees uh, centigrade uh, temperature, uh, but they re-examined these, these images, and what you can, they claim is there are sort of things that move around, and uh, that some of the things look like maybe uh, stuff you would find at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so they uh, said, well, maybe this is, there's evidence of something living. Now, the question is, how could anything possibly live at 500 degrees centigrade? Uh, they've done a number of analysis and said that if you begin to replace uh, carbon bonds with nitrogen, uh, that some of these things will be stable at high temperature. Uh, again, I think most people don't believe this, but it is an interesting question that that there is several courses of evidence that, that, and this one's a very tenuous one, but there's better evidence that in the upper atmosphere of Venus, there could be, there could be life. Now, uh, I, I wanna close with another question is, uh, uh, the, this is Robert Zubrin, and uh, he suggested that, uh, again, as I mentioned, that, that we're, we will have later this century the ability to send things interstellar distances using lasers. Uh, he suggested that you could program messages uh, in the genomes. And uh, uh, he's also been rather, you know, outspoken the idea that maybe we should look at genomes on Earth and see if there are there messages, either ancient or, or, or relatively recent. Uh, so this is one of the questions we're trying to look for is that where have we not looked for life? Uh, I, I really would be happy to close there and, and say that we are, our next meeting that we were going to have, the, uh, the Breakthrough Discuss Conference will be at UC Berkeley uh, just about a year from now. And we are going to look at the question of, of you know, is there more exotic life that we should be looking for? Uh, what are environments like Venus that, that you normally would dismiss that we should look for? And uh, what sort of uh, different ways might there be communication? Well, let me stop there and I'd be happy to answer any questions. I, I think there are probably some here, uh, uh, the, uh, the chat, let me see if I can. But uh, uh, if there's any questions, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much, Pete, for a, for a very a very inspiring talk, and I enjoy it a lot. And I also like the way that how you imagine how the god looks like. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty nice thing. So yeah, uh, it seems we we live in a in a in, in a very right times, and the revolution is happening in our eyes. And it also seems we have a lot of attendees who who are curious about many things. So uh, yeah, let me just choose some questions. Um, so we have a question here. Uh, why uh, breakthrough Starship choose laser sail propulsion? Propulsion are other propulsion options considered? Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Initially, when we started the program, we didn't have any uh, particular idea. Uh, the we we commissioned a a major study uh, by uh, Professor Loeb and his uh, his group on theory and computation at Harvard. Uh, we uh, sort of searched uh, the literature as well as asking people's opinions. Uh, the initial effort that people came forward with was, can we uh, use uh, antimatter? Uh, and it turns out we can make very small quantities of, uh, of antiprotons in an accelerator. Uh, and the question is, if we can make enough of that, can you, uh, can you get a very efficient propulsion system? 
Uh, it turns out that that you know most rocket systems are characterized or rocket systems are characterized by a parameter called specific impulse. Uh, this is sort of a measure of of the of the efficiency of a of a propellant. A, uh, a, a typical rocket today has a specific impulse of of three to four hundred. It's a, it's a, it's a measured in seconds, and uh, uh, you can go calculate using the rocket equation is how much fuel would you need to go interstellar distances uh, at 20% speed of light. And it turns out the mass of fuel is about the mass of the galaxy. So it's an unlikely uh, uh, thing, but if you could get much more efficient, uh, you know, several thousand times more efficient fuel, then you could potentially, you know, fuel a rocket. And uh, uh, the, the, the perfect fuel is if you could take antimatter and annihilate it with normal matter, you can actually get uh, six or eight million specific impulse. So that, that would be a perfect fuel. The trouble is, can we produce enough of it? And uh, there were some papers that NASA had funded uh, about 10 or 15 years ago that suggested you can. It turns out that uh, one of our advisors is Edward Witten at the Institute for Advanced Study. And, he pointed out there was an eight order of magnitude mistake in this calculation. So we had to kind of uh, abandon that, that question. Uh, in the meantime, NASA had funded another effort uh, uh, by Professor Phil Lubin at the University of uh, California at Santa Barbara. And uh, he pointed out that, that laser driven light sails, uh, that if you could make a very small spacecraft and build a very big laser, that those were becoming feasible might work. Uh, so uh, Professor Loeb and his group uh, looked at that and, uh, and we, st we did about a three month intensive study. Uh, Stephen Hawking looked at it quite carefully and appeared to be feasible. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we decided to proceed with that effort uh, and, uh, and, and Mr. Milner committed a uh, hundred million US dollars for a 10 year program to to get us to at least the point where maybe you could build a prototype. Uh, so that right now looks like the best approach. Although I will say that, that I'm quite intrigued with the idea of a fusion rocket. Uh, that there are a number of people developing fusion, uh, direct fusion propulsion. Uh, now it, it's fair to say that, you know, we haven't been able to produce any fusion energy other than in a bomb. <laughs> and uh, uh, that, uh, but some of these concepts look quite promising. Uh, if you go through the calculations, a fusion engine that of some of the types being proposed gives you a specific impulse of a few hundred thousand. Uh, it's probably a little low, but it may make it possible to send probes. Uh, uh, so we're watching that. If it turns out that our laser efforts look less promising and these other ones look better, uh, then we'll probably shift to, to those. Thank you. It seems we have more and more questions, so I would just choose uh, another one. So when searching for alien life, uh, should it include exploring unearth-like unearth environment and an unearth unearthly biochemistry? Alien life could even be within a physical presence. Is that also a consideration? A very good question. That's exactly what we're, we were having our major conference about this year, and we had to postpone until next year. Uh, the, uh, there's uh, some very, very interesting work that's been going on. Uh, one of the best groups is Professor Lee Cronin at the University of Glasgow. Uh, he's looking at, at other kinds of chemistries that could produce uh, life processes. Uh, he's pointed out that, that what we should look for is not to look for you know our life like DNA and RNA. We should look for molecular complexity. That uh, that an exotic life system. Uh, he says that anything that produces life is a it's sort of an information intensive in, intensification process. So that if you found that that molecular structures that are too complex contain too much information, uh, that that would be evidence of uh, of, of alien life. Uh, so, actually, if we do send one of these probes someplace in our solar system, the first thing we're going to look for is molecular complexity. That uh, that the, the molecules have you know have, have a lot more complexity than what we believe can be produced uh, uh, 
through natural processes. So that's a, uh, the, the first thing is that, that we should be very careful not to assume that it has to be like ours, our life. Uh, often I'm reminded there's, the, there's, a, there's an old story of, a, of a, a policeman is walking along the road and he sees a gentleman on his hands and knees underneath a lamp crawling around and he asked him what he's doing and he said that, well, I lost my keys. And the policeman said, well, maybe I can help you find them. And so he, for about a half hour, they looked under the lamppost. And finally, the policeman asked the, this gentleman that he said, Would, is this where you lost your keys? And the gentleman said, no, but this is the only place I can see. Uh, so, you know, I think that we, we need to start thinking differently. That uh, uh, indeed, one of the questions that, uh, that one of our collaborators and our advisors is uh, Professor Paul Davies at uh, Arizona State University. And he says we should look at our own planet for a evidence of a second genesis of another life form. You know, what's interesting to me is that, that, that uh, we didn't even know of one complete order of, of, of microbes uh, uh, until about 25, 30 years ago. We used to think there were just uh, uh, bacteria and uh, what are called eukaryotes, which is what we are. And about 30 years ago, we realized that the microbes, uh, the, the what are called prokaryotes, uh, were actually divided into two separate orders. Uh, and one of them is bacteria, the other was called archaea. And archaea are things that live in these very extreme environments, uh, uh, but they also are, are everywhere else. And the fact is on our own planet, we didn't even know one major, a third of the life forms. We couldn't, didn't even know they existed. So I think there's a lot of places we can look. And uh, it's a very good question, is what kind of exotic life? Uh, now, you know, there are people that think that the, one of the moons of, of Saturn, the big moon, Titan, has very strange chemistry on the surface. It has uh, actually lakes of liquid ethane and methane. And there are those that believe that there could be a, a different life process there. So one of the, there's a, NASA is sending the, the, I think it's called the, the dragonfly probe to, to Saturn and, and later in the decade. And so one of the things it may do is look for, look for evidence of really exotic life. So it's a, I think we need to open up our, our thinking process, which also says we need to open up our process of what we look for in terms of signaling from intelligence. Thank you. We have also a few questions uh, regarding to, to Mars. Uh, I will just pick one of them. Uh, what do you think about exploring Mars? Is it, the on, is it only a good try that will help us prepare for further travels or can we find some, something really interesting there or even colonize Mars? Well, that's a, a, a you know, a, a, that's a really big, you know, discussion of, you know, the, the first discussion is should we send people to the, back to the moon or to Mars to the idea of being to settle there? Uh, I think the moon is easier because it's closer and, and there's actually both governments and private groups going to do that. Mars is very interesting for two reasons. Uh, one is it has a lot more resources. It has uh, uh, lots of water. The moon has a little bit. And uh, it also has uh, volatiles that are necessary for life. So people like Elon Musk are very interested in settling there. And, and I think that that Mars is an excellent place to establish large-scale human settlements, except Mars may be life-bearing. Uh, there's increasing evidence from various probes that, that, that not only that Mars might have had life billions of years ago, it may still have it. And uh, uh, so there's a big question. It's probably deep underground uh, that uh, Mars at one time had oceans uh, and we now have detected there are large aquifers of water that are deep underground. So there may be life still in those. And uh, uh, I think before we decide to settle there, we need to understand, is there life there? And uh, it may be quite a hard thing. We may have to drill down hundreds of meters to, to, to get in those aquifers and see if they're life bearing. If there is, is life there, the first question is, is it compatible with ours? Uh, some people think that maybe if there's life on Mars or that maybe that was the original origin of life on Earth and uh, because of the material that's gone back and forth between Mars and the Earth. So I think Mars is very, very exciting. Uh, I think it's our best 
near-term bet to find life that may be a little more like what we expect. Uh, my next best bet is actually Venus. So there, as I said, the upper atmosphere is very exciting. Uh, and then Europa and Enceladus. But, uh, uh, but then Mars is, uh, is uh, assuming we can, we can figure out this, does life exist there? Is it, is it compatible with ours? that uh, it's probably the best place to have large-scale human settlements uh, uh, later this century. Okay, so let's move a bit from, well, let's say astronomy to space industry, uh, since we have a question also from, from that topic. What do you think, in which way the commercial space industry should develop? Uh, what factors could boost the process of space commercialization? Well, it's a very good question, and I've, uh, you know, of course, I've been involved in, in, those, in those questions. I think the number one thing that can help things is our ability to use resources in space. And, uh, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons that I've, in fact, I helped persuade Luxembourg to get involved in this question. Uh, they've now invested several hundred million euros in, in, uh, in, in uh, space resources. But, uh, the until we actually figure out how to, to make things in space from things we find in space you know if you have to bring everything from the planet it makes it very difficult to, especially the deeper in space we go uh, i think the first product that we'll get from space is actually fuel uh, uh fuel for uh, uh, and it'll probably just simple water uh that would be it could be cracked into hydrogen and oxygen using solar energy uh, that will enable us to go much deeper into space enable us to, to, to put initial settlements on the moon. Uh, Elon Musk makes the point with his starship uh, that, uh, that, uh, that he really needs to have fuel uh, stations in space to refuel it, to make it efficient to go back and forth uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Mars. So I think that's a very, very important question is the, is the, ability, to, is to, the ability to use resources. The second one is coming along quite well, and it's the ability to get a very low cost launch to space. And I've always been an advocate of reusable rockets, and we see both uh, uh, SpaceX and, uh, and uh, uh, Blue Origin, as well as other groups around the world. Uh, I think the Chinese are also working on reusable rockets that, that uh, you know, we wouldn't have much of an airline industry as every time you got an airline, you flew across the planet and threw away the airplane. Uh, so uh, the the idea is that if we can perfect reusable systems, that it really gives us access to space. Uh, the other thing is it is not just the reusable systems, but very low cost systems. Uh, as we see satellites becoming smaller and cheaper, uh, in the last uh, few a decade and a half, the CubeSats, the kilogram class spacecraft, have, have advanced very rapidly. Uh, uh, indeed, when I was the director at NASA Ames, we had a lot of young people that were involved in this. Uh, one group I'm quite proud of is, uh, is Planet. They, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a company now in San Francisco that has launched hundreds of, of these small CubeSats that they can image every place in the planet every day. So the, uh, the next big step, I think, is making satellites even smaller. That's why I'm very excited about these Gram class spacecraft I showed. So. So those are the things I would say would really help commercialization uh, move along quickly. So maybe two last questions, just uh, not to make it longer. Uh, one is related to a very general astronomy, let's say, question, mm -hmm. uh, but it had the, the, the highest number of votes because it seems <laughs> the participants can also vote for a question. Oh, yes. <laughs> Since the universe is constantly expanding, would we ever be able to escape out from our local group or would it be impossible due to the speed at which other local groups are moving away from us? Well, the, 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 I guess the, the key question there is that uh, we're all part of that. And uh, uh, you know, the local group of galaxies is, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe a few million light years across. Uh, the, uh, if you, if you look at the, uh, uh, and the next nearest groups are maybe five or 10 million light years away, uh, that, you know, I believe that even at sublight speeds at the ability to go at 10 or 20% the speed of light, 
we could travel, you could, you could actually send things across our galaxy uh, in uh, a few million years. So this, is, this leads to one of the, the very interesting questions, it's called the Fermi paradox, is that uh, uh, if there was an alien technological civilization, you know, we're already uh, this century probably the ability to send probes interstellar distances, and we can probably establish life uh, you know, in the nearer solar systems, it wouldn't take very long for, for a civilization to spread across the galaxy. And it probably wouldn't take very long for it to travel between galaxies. Now, when I say long, that's in the time scale. So in terms of leaving our local group of galaxies, you know, you know maybe in a few hundred million years, you could do that. Uh, that's not long compared to the expansion rate. Uh, now, obviously, you never could catch up with the, with the, with the expansion, uh, you know, unless we find a way around uh, the speed of light, which is uh, Hawking in his last book said it's possible, but very unlikely. Uh, so I think that the answer is that, that, that in the fullness of time, we may see, you know, that we may see that, that something that we create can spread across our galaxy, can go to other galaxies, and it might spread to, uh, uh, a small distance into the universe, but uh, the question of, of across the universe is probably impossible as far as we know it. Thank you. And uh, also a question from our, one of our panelists. Uh, what do you think about doing a movie on ISS with NASA by Tom Cruise that was recently <laughs> announced? So. Well, I, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about the International Space Station. Uh, when I worked for NASA, I was sort of a critic, and uh, although I, it, it turns out that, that I became less of a critic when we did some very interesting experiments on board the International Space Station. Uh, you know, I think the, uh, that, uh, that there are a couple things the ISS did. First of all, it was the, uh, uh, it's been the, the, the largest international science program, and it really brought a lot of countries together. And, uh, uh, its value is a is a demonstration that we can work together, you know, as a people of the planet, is a very important one uh, on a scientific question. And I think that that you know that's really critical to obviously handling the current uh, current crisis. So the idea of doing a movie there is a good one. And uh, uh, I know that NASA initially was kind of you know pretty negative on letting tourists and others go to space uh, to the space station, but but now it turns out they said if, if you can get there on your own, you can stay there for thirty thousand U.S. dollars a night, uh, which is actually less than certain hotels I know of in in, in Las Vegas. Uh, not that I would ever stay there, but uh, uh, so I think the the idea of having a movie there is very exciting. Now the other thing is we you mentioned the commercial development. There are groups uh, I think one of them is called Axiom, who is, are trying to develop a commercial space station attached or close to the to the uh, International Space Station. Uh, I can imagine that, uh, that uh, the commercial space stations that will probably be there within, uh, within this decade that are probably the best place to have these movies because uh, they're gonna be more uh, interested in, in, in trying to make money from, from the entertainment industry. But, but I think it's a great idea. I think uh, you know, Tom Cruise is a great actor and uh, uh, you know, I hope they go do that. So we just can't wait to to watch it and uh, and a very very last uh, it's it's my person well my qu question for me let's say so um, um, the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019 was was awarded to to the topic of exoplanets uh, and then search what in your opinion would be the next step the next uh, Nobel Prize Prize lev uh, level results in terms of searching for life in universe or exoplanetary science. What would be a no Nobel Prize thing in that topics? Well, I think there are two of them. Uh, one of them is obviously if we found uh, life on Mars or in the atmosphere of Venus or life in, you know, the plumes of water from Europa or Enceladus. Uh, indeed, we we didn't have any trouble getting scientists to volunteer to help work with us on that. Uh, it was a very exciting uh, uh, effort, and I think if that you know that's quite possible that we'll have an answer to that this decade. Uh, 
The second one is if we find evidence for a life-bearing planet orbiting one of the nearby stars. And uh, of course, the key thing there is uh, that evidence would be uh, that we're beginning to, in fact, there's this next generation of, of telescopes being built on the ground. The, the, uh, uh, the, the, the ELTs, the extremely large telescopes, the you know, 30 to 40 meter class, those are, are re reasonable enough that they could actually get a spectrum of the atmosphere of a planet orbiting one of the nearby stars. If we found uh, a planet that had oxygen and water, uh, the, most people believe that is, is, is compelling evidence that there's life because oxygen uh, doesn't exist. It's a, it's a non-equilibrium gas. It would combine with with the uh, rocks and other things, and, and it would need something like life to sustain it. Uh, and that could happen very soon. Another way to do it is actually with the James Webb Space Telescope. The, uh, the, the, the transiting exoplan uh, exoplanet survey uh, satellite, which was launched here about two years ago, TESS, is beginning to find planets orbiting some of the nearby stars, particularly the red dwarf stars that are Earth size and uh, are actually in the habitable zone, that uh, once the James Webb Space Telescope comes up, it can actually take a spectrum of the star when the planet's in front of the star and when it's not. And when it's in front of the star, you actually see some of the light goes through the planetary atmosphere. We can get a spectrum again of, of the planetary atmosphere. Uh, this method's already been shown to work, but uh, we need the Space Telescope and the, uh, we need a test to tell what to look for. So I think uh, that we may find, either we'll find life in our solar system, or we'll find evidence of a life-bearing uh, exoplanet. And I think those are clearly Nobel Prize materials. Although I, I should give an advertisement for, you know, the, the, I'm also the chairman of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. Uh, we give the Breakthrough Prizes, which are uh, three times the size of the Nobel Prize, I might add. And they're sponsored by by people like Yuri Milner, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Sergey Brin, uh, Andrews Whiskey, uh, Pony Ma in China. So uh, the uh, so we're actually competing a bit with that Swedish prize. I'm not supposed to mention. So so uh, uh, and it's more money. So uh, I think probably both prizes will end up being given to that if, if either of those discoveries are proven. So can someone get both prizes? Like you know, yes, <laughs> no a number, a number of people have gotten both prizes. Okay. Okay. So yeah. So, so the best thing is to get both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a yeah, that would be cool. So yeah, many thanks for answering all. Well, not all of our questions. So uh, my apologies to all of the participants who asked the questions, but I couldn't read them because we are running out of of, of time. Uh, so thank you very much. And um, just to to finish up before I I I, I, um, I give the microphone to 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 Bartosz, I would like to wish you all. Um, healthy times and clear night and stay safe uh, also of uh, corona borealis and uh, other corona that we know so yeah well, well, well thank you thank you and as i noted i once i am able to i'm looking forward to visiting poland we'd like to discuss some of these missions uh, with, uh, with people there that would be really awesome since we also had a lot of uh, questions from young people who would like to be involved in the in space projects and uh, yeah we will we will right. really look forward for that so thank you very much thank you milana thank you very much for uh, moderating uh, this this uh, panel pete thank you for a great presentation and for uh, being for uh, with us and answering all questions i would like just to say that you have uh, a big hug from a polish uh, president of polish agency uh, space agency michal uh, he would he says you all the time uh, that you are a great person uh, and and uh, to, 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 to be honest uh, he was the person who said uh, you have to uh, you have to invite uh, Pete to the 
to the uh, panel. Thank you very much for being with us. And I would like to say all attendees, thank you that you were with us because I know the time is not very good for webinars. It's uh, now it's uh, 10, 1030, but the person uh, who is uh, Pete was so great that I'm sure that uh, next uh, webinars will be uh, similar to this. Thank you uh, to, all, to all of you. And I will show uh, once again our film. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Dzięki Milena, do zobaczenia. I dziękuję wszystkim Państwu. Dobrej nocy. Trzymaj się, hej. Cześć.